Hello and welcome to Podcast Bridging Voices, the online discussion forum of the Multinational Development Policy Dialogue of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation in Brussels. My name is Louis Mourier, Program Manager for Climate Policy at the Foundation, and today we're discussing the EU's water diplomacy in the Himalayas. Just a few weeks ago, CAS and the East West Institute launched a new joint working group on the future of the EU's water diplomacy with a strong focus on how to make European engagement across water stress regions more effective. On 12 November, we had our first meeting on hydro diplomacy in the Himalayas. And today, we would like to follow up on the key issues that were addressed during the joint working group session. For that, we have two fantastic speakers on board who also joined us in our first joint working group session. With us is Fava Ama, director of the South Asia program at the East West Institute. Hi, Fava. Hello. Hi. Happy to be here. And we also have Susanne Schmeier, um, Associate Professor of Water Law and Water Diplomacy at the IHE Delft Institute at The Hague. Hi, Susanne. Hi. Nice to join you today. As we all know, water security is poised to become a defining global issue of the 21st century. Already half of the world's population is living in countries that are affected by strong or even extreme water scarcity. And on top of that, rivers, lakes, and watersheds flow across national borders, often between competitive neighbors that have to share scarce water resources. So it's very clear that water issues really have the potential to be a threat multiplier on an international level. This applies in particular to the Himalaya region, an area where, where water is a highly contested issue, not only because it's among the regions that are badly affected by increasing water scarcity, but also because this is an area where we have heavy geopolitical clashes between major powers, including India, Pakistan, and China. The potential of water to be a threat multiplier in the Himalaya region actually became clear once again a few days ago. Just recently, China has announced its plans to build a new super dam on the lower reaches of the Brahmaputra, one of the region's biggest rivers. And unsurprisingly, this came to the dismay of downstream countries like India and Bangladesh. And the developments seem emblematic for the region's struggle to agree on a joint approach to water-related issues. Fava, um, let me start with you. You're from Pakistan ah. yourself and an, and an expert on hydro diplomacy in the Himalayas. Um, can you tell us, what do these recent developments reveal about the broader problems of hydro diplomatic engagement in the region? Uh, thank you so much, Louis. I think uh, this entire development that we've had in the past few days, that is definitely caught the attention of the downstream countries, as you rightly mentioned, India and Bangladesh, but it's also not unsurprising. that There has been speculation for quite some time about China developing its hydropower uh, project stream and taking it to the lower reaches of the Yerlang Sangpo or more popularly known as the Brahmaputra in India. And uh, there, China, China has this uh, tendency of developing its hydropower uh, projects and it has been doing it so for a while. So this new dam that uh, is projected to be built um, in the Medong County, which is closer to the Arunachal Pradesh, uh, was uh, is likely to exacerbate all the uh, existing anxieties that are already between India and China following the border clashes uh, about seven months ago. So at this time, when there are tensions across the LSE, there is economic decoupling between these two Himalayan neighbors. You, When you hear the news of China building this massive dam, which could have a possible adverse impact on the ecological systems and the water flow to the downstream nations like India and um, Bangladesh, um, we, there, there is going to be concern, there is going to be apprehension. We've seen this in the past, uh, that despite a water sharing, um, like a data sharing, hydrological data sharing MOU between India and China, there have been uh, reservations uh, where China has not been able to fully provide the, hydro the hydrological data that India requires during the, um, you know, the seasonal floods and everything that has happened right after the Doklam standoff. So in this context, and keeping all of that in mind, at the same time, the geopolitical tensions and uh, th that are rife between these countries, it's very hard uh, for uh, hydro diplomatic engagement to take place. And we've seen that in the history of the region in its own. Geopolitical tensions and other political tensions, security tensions have led water to become a national security tool. 
uh, they are always looked at from a national security standpoint uh, instead of looking at uh, it as a humanitarian or a natural resource that should be equitably shared. What is making this even more problematic is that we don't have an entire regional sense of joint uh, collaboration on shared waters. There are uh, that we we do have an example of uh, the Indus Water Commission that uh, governs the Indus Water Treaty between India and Pakistan, and that has stood the test of times. It has stood the test of two wars. Um, but then again, despite that treaty, uh, we still hear of how uh, the treaty can be revoked if there is escalation between those two countries. The threat always looms. We've seen that even between um, India and Bangladesh, despite the 1972 water commission that exists between them. And these, there are, so while we have these bilateral arrangements, we have like the India-China MOU that I talked about also earlier, despite all of these being there, there's still a lot of anticipation. There's still a lot of uh, speculation and apprehension. And this is because there is no joint regional framework that can gather all the upstream countries and the downstream countries together and say, yes, you know, China is building a dam. Do you think it's mutually beneficial to the downstream countries? Um, so there is no way of ensuring that there is benefit sharing when a hydropower project happens on the upstream. There is, uh, there's no approval seeking. So, and that creates the rift. So right now, what is happening is that India is planning for its own what it's what's being called as a rival project on their Arunachal Pradesh as well, because they're uh, worried about the repercussions that this giant dam is going to have. China has this notion that this dam is going to lead to regional cooperation. It's going to lead to economic prosperity. That's the point of view or the narrative that China is um, in delivering to the world, to the region, uh, because um, it's because the China, the said dam is supposed to uh, produce energy thrice the amount of their largest dam till date, which is the Three Gorges Dam. So when you have so much energy being produced uh, and China does not need this energy, China says that it's likely going to be exported to neighboring regions that need it the most. So in that sense, it's going to create a scope for regional cooperation. But we are yet to see. There's not enough information on the far reaching impacts that people are scared about. There's also not enough information on how this could be helpful. Again, if there was a joint framework, if there was a mechanism that could provide enough hydrological data between these regional countries on when such instances happen, there would be less speculation, there'd be less threat of water being weaponized. So in uh, the, the long and short of it all is that uh, we come back to why we're having this conversation. The lack of having a regional arrangement is, uh, or lack of having enough information or hydrological data between riparian countries causes this chaos. And this this along with uh, the geopolitical tensions that are always going to be rife and the mistrust that is between the regional uh, member states of South Asia, uh, they just exacerbate uh, any sort of uh, situation that occurs like this recent development. So I'll, I'll just stop here. Fantastic, Fava. Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful overview of where we're standing at the moment in matters of water diplomacy um, in the region. And I think it became very clear that water is indeed perceived as a national security tool, which then conversely undermines this, this need for region-wide cooperation on water issues. Zane, let me get to you. And I think Faber touched on, on one of the key points here. Um, it's not the first time that China's hydropower projects and water policies have attracted criticism from across the region. Um, as Fava noted, in India, there are concerns that China may exercise its leverage and weaponize water for geopolitical ends at some point or another. Um, some even say that China is striving for water hegemony in the Himalayas. Um, Zani, you work yourself um, in the region of water diplomacy, including an, in the Mekong River Commission, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and therefore, I would like to ask you, what exactly is China's role in the region in matters of water? Um, and taking into account the recent military clashes that between China and India that Fava also touched on, um, can you realistically expect that China would be willing to have a serious discussion with downstream countries on region-wide cooperation mechanisms in the future? Thanks a lot for, for the question, Louis. I think if we want to understand China's role in water diplomacy in the Himalayan region or in any other region that it uh, shares with its neighboring countries over transboundary rivers, I think we have to look at a number of factors that you and Fava have touched upon already. Let me maybe start with geography. 
So if you look at the Greater Himalayan watershed, as it's often called, um, we know that this is the water tower of the world. It holds as much or it holds more ice and water than any other place in the world except for the two poles. It actually provides water to more than a quarter of the world's population that depends on it for its agricultural activities, for drinking water supply, for hydropower generation as well. And if we look at the geography, if we look at the map very closely, we can see that on all of these rivers, be it the Salvin, be it the Pramaputra, the Ganges, the Mekong, the Indus, China is upstream. So on all of the rivers that provide water to these more than 25% of the world's population, China sits at the source. It's actually Tibet, so a very special part of China that is the source of many of these rivers. So I think that puts China in a, in a position that is unique to any other country in the world and that at first glance at least, or from a very short term perspective, might not provide China with a lot of incentives to cooperate with neighboring states, if we look at it from a purely water perspective. That might be different if we take um, regional cooperation, trade and economic ties um, into account as well. Secondly, if we look um, at the history of China's engagement in water diplomacy, in the region, but also generally, we can see that China has always been preferring bilateral engagement. China is not a member or has not even voted in favor, but actually voted against the 1997 UN Water Courses Convention, being one out of three states only that actively voted against the convention. It is not part of any major international water agreement. There are actually only very few agreements, the, the MOU on data sharing that Fava has mentioned that exists between India and China and Bangladesh and China. Interesting side note here that in the MOU with India, China requires India to pay for the data to be shared, whereas for Bangladesh, with whom China tries to establish uh, closer economic ties, the data is being provided for free. And the other instrument is a data sharing agreement with the Mekong River Commission that exists since 2010, where China shares data to the Mekong River Commission in order for them to share it on to the member countries of the Mekong River Commission, so Laos, Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam, for them to use for flood protection. But there is no other international instrument, and there's also very little multilateral engagement. In fact, China has always been discussing water issues and many of them, of them have occurred in the past years on a bilateral basis. So when there were, for example, blames that low flows in the Mekong in the past years were caused, potentially caused by Chinese dams, China has preferred bilateral discussions. The same was the case as Faber has alluded to in the Himalayan region or towards, towards India. And that is simply because China wants to avoid setting precedent. As I said, China is upstream, on all of the river basins, no matter whether east, west, south or north that it shares with other countries and feels that entering, for example, into a legal binding agreement with any of these countries or any other river basin commission that might exist there would set precedent for others. So looking at that, I think it is rather, it is not very likely, let's put it this way, that China would engage in any cooperation initiative over transboundary waters, especially if such an, an initiative was legally binding. So if it was aiming at setting up an international water treaty and or if such an initiative was multilateral. That might be different for more uh, soft law instruments such as MOUs. It might be different for bilateral or maybe small trilateral regional arrangements. But I don't see a great appetite on the Chinese side to enter into into real treaties and especially not, I would think, to enter into something that Fava has alluded to that would be necessary is a, a beyond river basin arrangement. So where all the rivers uh, originating from the Himalayas would be looked at in a, in a consistent in an integrated manner. What we see, however, is China setting up its own cooperation mechanisms. The most famous one is maybe the Lansang Mekong cooperation, which uh, is at least by some regarded as a, a competitor to the Mekong River Commission. Uh, similar initiatives might be emerging towards other countries more in South, e South Asia as well. But these are not so much aimed at governing water resources, at setting standards, agreeing to certain principles of water use, of equitable sharing and so on but more, have more of an economic background and try to boost China's economic um, 
cooperation with these countries, especially also in the context of the Belts and Roads Initiative. To sum that up, China is interested in cooperation, but more for economic reasons. Cooperation, especially if establishing binding rules, specifically over water resources, is something that I do not really see happening in the near future. Thank you very much, Susanne, for this very, very interesting answer on, on my questions, uh, um, especially the point that China prefers bilateral engagement and that engagement on a multilateral level has not really taken place in the, in, in the past years and also doesn't seem very realistic when we look to the future. Um, this seems to be a, a rather dire point um, when we look when we speak about region-wide cooperation. Um, and Faber, I just want to continue a bit on this particular issue that China doesn't seem to be engaged multilaterally on, on water issues and especially avo um, avoids any legally binding agreements. Um, how is that perceived in countries such as Pakistan, where you're from, or also India? So I'm going to definitely echo what uh, Susanna just mentioned. China has reservations, strong reservations to get itself involved in any sort of multilateral bindings or sort of strong legal agreements with a lot of strings attached. Uh, because China, like, you know, we've talked about this, is upstream to not only rivers in the Himalayas, but beyond. It has so much leverage that it's not really going to uh, come to the table and talk about water cooperation because it doesn't harm them in any manner. So, and China has a great strategic sense as we have learned over the years. You know, when we look at their economic uh, pathways, when we look at the uh, BRI, for example, that Susanna just mentioned, um, we, we are looking at a country that has uh, established its moves, it has, it, has, uh, it has plans, it has five year plans, 10 years plans, 20 year plans, and they're all derived from uh, the kind of economic impact they want to have within their own country and beyond. So when we talk about, for example, Pakistan that you mentioned, Pakistan and China have a uh, a very strong relationship. They are all weather allies, uh, as China claims and Pakistan claims. Their relationship is sweeter than honey, and uh, and there's some very uh, uh, pretty fancy words uh, that are used to describe the re this relationship. And uh, one of the greatest examples you can see of how um, important this relationship is to Pakistan is through the um, BRI's flagship project being based out of Pakistan, which is the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which involves multiple projects, which in uh, which has infrastructure projects, which has energy projects, but also has hydropower projects. And one of the key ones that has uh, come up in the recent uh, month or uh, in, in the past year is the Daimar Pasha Dam, which is uh, China through China's help, uh, Pakistan is building. Uh, and it's a part of the CPEC project. But it's something that India does not very much approve of. Why? Because it falls near the disputed territory of Jammu and Kashmir. So again, this dam, which is, if you look at it, is a hydropower development from China's side, and it's set to benefit Pakistan, set to benefit China, but it again falls back to the geopolitical element. It, 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 it's being close to LOC, being close to being in the disputed territory, it's going to invite uh, the same sort of apprehension from India following the weak political ties that India and Pakistan have had for past uh, 60 years or so. This relationship asymmetry is existing in the region as well. So China is close to Pakistan and there are difficulties in China India relationship and there are very apparent difficulties in China Pakistan relationship. When you look at, when you ask uh, but the, Pax, the sitting Pakistan government right now, they are going to be supportive of everything China does uh, because they are the, they are the immediate allies that they have uh, from an economic standpoint, from a national security standpoint, defense standpoint. And India is going to voice its criticisms with regards to China's, uh, you, you, there is the mass diplomacy and all. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that I think that's something that I just wanted to add, but I hope that serves the question. Perfect. Thanks so much, Faber. Uh, um, and again, I think your your comments make very clear that actually there is a need for some sort of transboundary governance institutions to deal with uh, water issues um, in the region. And let's move forward to um, the, the issue of these uh, transboundary water governance um, institutions, because very often they're perceived as the key to a successful water diplomacy. But actually, um, setting up these institutions or also river-based organizations does not automatically, automatically lead to better relations among riparian countries, right? I mean, like if you look, for, for example, to Central Asia or also to the Nile Delta, these are regions where we have um, institutions, but where 
water conflicts continue to exist. Um, Suzanne, let me get back to you on this issue because you worked a lot and you, you've also written a lot on, on um, transboundary water governance institutions. And um, which role can institution building realistically play in international hydro diplomacy? And in your mind, uh, how, how should um, these institutions ideally look like when it comes to decision making and policy making powers to prevent an escalation of water tensions? What we do know from empirical evidence around the world is that these transboundary water governance institutions or also basin organizations, as they're sometimes called, do make a difference. Not to the same extent in all transboundary watersheds around the world, but they tend to, do, to make a difference simply because they move a momentarily commitment to cooperation that countries might have into some long-term institutionalized cooperation mechanism. And they can therewith help to maintain cooperation even when times get tricky, when conflicts emerge. And Fava earlier mentioned the Indus Water Treaty and the Permanent Indus Commission, which is a, a very typical case of that. So it was established in 1960 and it has managed to survive in spite of all the, the clashes and the conflicts that have existed between India and Pakistan since then. So we do know that these institutions make a difference, but we also know that it is very difficult to set them up and even more difficult to maintain them over time. If we look at the institutions themselves and how they should look like, what we know across the board is that it is probably most important that they provide a platform for decision making so that they're designed in the way that the countries that commit to cooperate indeed also regularly come together and cooperate meetings are being organized, data and information is being exchanged, and they provide a platform to address any contested issues, any potentially emerging disputes in a way that they're contained in that institutional framework and do not escalate. And the two examples that you mentioned, Central Asia with the Rogun Dam and the Nile River Basin with the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam are exactly cases where these disputes moved out of the institutional frameworks and were ultimately handled between some of the basins countries only. Whereas what we see in the Mekong, for example, there was a, a potentially similarly problematic dispute over the Sayaburi Dam, which was the first mainstream dam constructed by Laos in the lower Mekong Basin. But that dispute was contained within the Mekong River Commission's framework and was addressed through regular meetings and, and that's another important factor of these institutions, through an institutionalized dispute resolution mechanism. These two decision-making platforms, dispute resolutions plus data and information exchange, so informing all the countries about the state of the river, of the water management issues that it faces, and potentially also about future uses, is really the, the key contribution that these basin organizations can make. Ultimately, however, whether they do have these mechanisms in place and whether countries then actively use them will depend on the willingness of, of member states of these organizations to engage in them. And that's where, where we see problems emerging, especially if some countries in the region or in a river basin might not be part of these institutions. That's what, what we see in a number of different basins. We're looking at the Ganges, but also looking at the Mekong, that some countries, in this case, specifically China, is not a part of the river basin organization that actually exists already in the basin. Thank you very much, Susanne. And, and I think the last point actually seems to be very important that in the end, the effectiveness of these institutions are a function uh, um, of engagement of member states, right? And if member states are not willing to engage and are not willing to sit on the table and to speak to each other, then no institution can have the capacities to deal with, um, with, with potential conflicts. But I think also the other three points that you mentioned, so a platform for decision making, uh, uh, disputes, dispute resolution mechanisms, and also data sharing are extremely important. Um, but Fava, let's get a bit back to the region that we're covering today, because contrary to what uh, Zane just outlined could be the ideal features of a successful transboundary water governance institution, and also contrary to global best practices, South Asia's collaboration on transboundary waters, as you already mentioned, um, has been rather bilateral and issue-based, thereby often eluding um, Bessian-level approaches to governance. You already mentioned that geopolitics is one of the key reasons, but I know that there are also some other issues which are driving this lack of region-wide engagements, such as uh, a range of knowledge gaps. And I also wanted to ask you beyond the, what are the additional reasons uh, for the lack of region-wide engagement, isn't there room 
for existing institutional frameworks such as the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation to facilitate the establishment of a Himalayan uh, river basin organization. Thank you, Louis, for that. So there is there's a bit of a positive response to this, and there's also a realistic uh, response to this. So the first, I'll go with the realistic response. The issues that sort of hinder collaboration uh, in the South Asian region uh, on, on transboundary water governance, or whether it be any governance uh, between member states, is the political tensions that we have highlighted. That's key. But then when you look at from an institutional standpoint, why do these things don't work? It's because South Asia is heavily bureaucratic. It's very bureaucratic. There are many thresholds that you need to cross to get your point to the top. Where So there, you need cooperation on not one level, but all levels for a policy to really be implemented and to have an impact. So when we look at the water framework, you know, if you're looking at just water sharing, it has to be multidisciplinary. It is something that needs voices from all stakeholders. South Asia is known for its agrarian economy. When you look at India, when you look at Pakistan, a fair share of an, their economy is supported by agriculture. So farmers and people who run the agricultural sector, they need to be involved. These Those are important stakeholders in the water uh, conversations. Public sector is an important uh, participant. Private sector all of these big corporations, businesses that are uh, now the middlemen or are affected by water shortages, they need to be involved. But there is no arrangement to actually get all of these voices uh, together. The stakeholder engagement is low, mainly because there is a lot of bureaucracy on national and regional level. So if you look only with, within the country itself, it'll be hard to make a big change, leave alone getting regional member states to, together to talk about what's happening on their national ends and how they can share best practices. That's another major hindrance. Now, when we look at existing frameworks for regional cooperation like SARC that you mentioned, and SARC started off uh, on a very high note in the 2000s. It was doing well in the early 2000s. But then it for a long time, Time. It has been sadly a zombie organization. It has not been made, been able to make much stride in many affairs. And this is because the charter of Stark firstly does not allow it to be involved in any political uh, or polemical issues. So uh, Sark kind of stays away from anything that becomes too political anyways. Then you have a lot of strategic and power imbalance in Sark because of the countries. So you have India and on the, hand, on the other hand, you have Pakistan. So after the, the September 26 events uh, that have happened and ever since then, India-Pakistan relationships have de-escalated, you've not found a lot of cooperation happening on Sark for both fronts. But is now I'm going to come and talk about the positive side of it. Is there room? Sure. We have the South Asian disaster management uh, side of it, which that wing has actually worked on uh, disaster management in the region. So when you look at that, you can you say, yes, you know, there have been some impact that this institution has been able to deliver. So why not bring the same and do it towards a to extend it beyond and involve water sharing on a higher level and get more regional players? South uh, SAR can do that. But would SAR do that is the question. I personally think that these political tensions that are right between neighboring countries at this point in time, and at the same time, the bureaucratic issues and the capacity challenges. You touched upon the knowledge gaps, but there are also severe capacity challenges that these countries face. At, you know, at the end of the day, these countries are not developed countries. All of them are not developed countries. They have major hindrances when it comes to financial obligations. So those capacity cha uh, challenges coupled with all the other things you've mentioned, they really kind of uh, uh, serve as a setback to any existing or any institutions in the making. Thank you very much, Father. Uh, these are very, very important points. And I actually very much liked uh, um, how you framed SARC as a zombie organization, which in the past didn't really uh, prove to be very effective when it comes to political or security related issues. Um, on the other hand, I was also very happy to hear that you think there is room for cooperation and there is room for engagement. And that one thing that in the past has been lacking is this capacity development. So these capacity challenges, which hinder more engagement in, in the region. And this brings me to a further topic. And for, unfortunately, also the last topic of today, because we slowly have to come to an end um, of our discussion. Um, but the topic that I would, would like to address um, is basically the role of the EU, 
because here in Brussels, obviously, that's, this is a major topic for us. And also, um, the EU has been a long-standing supporter of transboundary water governance. Um, in its 2018 Council conclusions on water diplomacy, the EU highlighted the pivotal importance of developing and maintaining institutionalized water governance mechanisms in conflict-ridden regions. But in the past, and I think we all know that, uh, the EU has been also very famous for its well-known expectations capabilities gap. So um, its tendency to raise global ambitions um, without backing it up with effective policies on the ground. Susanne, you've worked a lot on EU water diplomacy. You've also been involved with, with GIZ, one of the leading um, organizations that deal with water across the world uh, from an EU basis. Therefore, I would like to ask you, to what extent has the EU been actually able to implement its hydro diplomatic objectives? And where does the union need to refine its policies and tools to strengthen the establishment of transboundary water governance institutions? Your question, or you've already given some sort of answer to your question by referring to the expectations capabilities gap. I think that's what exactly also applies to EU water diplomacy. I mean, the council conclusions on water diplomacy were a major step forward, both the 2013 ones, so the first ones, and the 2018 ones. I mean, the 2013 Council conclusions for the first time really highlighted water and water-related tensions as an issue in EU foreign policy and in the foreign policy of EU member states. And the 2018 conclusions further reiterated that and added the link to climate security and the challenges that might come with climate change for water tensions. The Council conclusions were supposed to bring momentum to the EU's engagement in water diplomacy. There was supposed to be an impetus to developing projects at the EU level and at the member country level. And that's where we see the gaps, I would say, if we look at the EU level. So the EU is engaged in, in a number of different projects, some of them linked to the external action service, others linked to, to DEFCO, others linked to DG environment, but I would say that they largely fall behind expectations. This is a bit different when we look at individual EU member countries, that often also is the financial support of the European Commission actually implement water diplomacy activities just to name two that are quite well known that are being implemented by, by GIZ, the EU German engagement in the Nile River Basin that is supporting the Nile Basin initiatives, initiative as the region's basin organization, but has also lately been involved in negotiations over the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, not overly successfully though, the EU and Germany's engagement in Central Asia in the context of what was formerly called the Berlin process and what's now called the Green Central Asia Initiative, where a lot of difference really has been made by bringing Central Asian countries and now also Afghanistan together through formal negotiations, but also through more informal training programs, um, university activities, smaller projects that have been implemented and so on. But I think there's definitely on the EU side room for improvement. Let me just mention two things that relate very much to what we discussed here, the Himalayans. So there is the China EU water platform and there's also the China, uh, the India EU water platform. Both of them, I think, do really great work when it comes to exchanging knowledge and building capacity in China and India, respectively, with regards to water management, water quantity management, water quality issues, integrated water resource management. But they focus exclusively on China and India, respectively. But as we discussed, um, it would be helpful to have a platform that maybe links the two countries and others in the region, and maybe the EU as the symbol of regional integration itself could have a role to play here in linking these platforms and linking the different countries in Central Asia, uh, in, in, in the Himalayan region, sorry. So I think there's definitely room, there's definitely great aspirations and great expectations on the side of EU member states, on the side of the civil society and on the side of the, the partner states in the Himalayan region. But I think more work definitely has to be done on that. Thank you, Susanne. Um, very interesting and also very interesting ins um, insight that 
basically the council conclusions of 2018 seem to provide new impetus at the at the at the beginning but then again as we as we know from other policy fields where the eu is engaged externally expectations have not been met and it's also very interesting that actually member states seem to be the driving forces and the, and the ones who are in the driving seats um, rather than the eu institutions themselves but you all, but you mentioned two points uh, where the eu uh, still has some room for improvement. And I would like to give the floor to Fava for some final comments. Um, Fava, drawing from what Susanne just said, um, what in your eyes are the entry points for the EU and its member states in matters of water in the Himalayas? Um, how can the EU set incentives for stronger cooperation um, in the region? And what do Himalayan ex um, actors expect um, of Europe in that regard? I definitely agree with uh what Susanna just said, there is a lot of aspiration. So, and one needs to distinguish what's aspirational and what's realistic, right? So there is a lot of aspiration as to what the council conclusions can deliver or what the EU water framework directive could deliver. And we've seen um, as what Susanna just pointed out in terms of the EU-India water partnership, you know, there, there has been some sort of a uh, movement that has happened by the EU being involved in the Himalayan waters. Um, there is uh, definitely an interest of what we've seen through our work in the recent times. There is an interest to learn more about what's happening in the region. There is interest in learning more about the water scarcity, the water stresses, and the impacts of it on the region. So those are those give you hope that there is uh, definitely room for EU to be involved and possibly play the role of a third party solicitor. This is what the region needs. The region needs a mediator. Now, when and it's not like some while it's something uh, that is still open to discussion because um, a lot of countries and we've seen that in uh, in other regions as well when you talk about the Euphrates Tigris River Basin uh, Iraq and Syria are open to third party mediation Turkey is not so these kind of uh, sort of asymmetries between and imbalances between uh, decision making and approvals happen in other regions as well and same applies to uh, South Asia but it's not like this has not happened in the past we have had the World Bank kind of broker the Indus Water Treaty of 1960 so the EU definitely has um, uh, the sort of it has the capacity it has the capability and if the right political will is committed to, if the right uh, emphasis is put in in its own policy framework, in its own policy agenda towards the region, I think it can definitely make an impact. When you look at from the Himalayan region's perspective, from this side of the world, um, I think the most civil society actors or uh, the non-profit sec sectors or the regional experts who are working on water, they will welcome th third party solicitation because they realize what are the obstacles that the region has. The region on its own is, mm, we've seen that uh, through the history, we've seen, we've seen it now, it's not capable of bringing uh, all of the regional stakeholders together. So what it needs is international impetus uh, and EU could be that player. Fun fact, in EU is actually an observer at SARC and so is China. So EU can definitely play a role. I personally don't know how much room there is depending on how where SARC stands. But when we talked about uh, initially that whether SARC can play a role, per perhaps EU can provide that push that SARC needs as an observer. Um, whether it'll make an impact, that's for the regional member states to really determine. But I think there are entry points in terms of helping sharing the best practices that EU has developed over the years within its own borders. So that could help close some of the knowledge gaps. There's still a lot of learning that the region needs to do in terms of hydrological planning. So and e they can learn from what EU has done within its own borders and how it has implemented or helped a work with other regions like Central Asia. For the EU to actually make that sort of take its knowledge and its expertise in the right direction, it'll have to acquaint itself with the region and the region's challenges a little bit more. And that's where uh, I think um, we come into play where we can sort of play the bridging gap and help uh, provide information on both sides so that there's more room. There's a channel for EU to communicate with the regional stakeholders. There's a channel for EU to communicate with the regional experts and learn a little bit more about what the challenges lie. And then um, what EU can do is not to replicate what it has done in its within its regions, but to provide its practices and provide its knowledge in a way that is best applicable to the region. 
and work with the regional stakeholders, work with these experts, with the policymakers to sort of plan the best way forward, whether it's towards uh, facilitating a uh, regional basin organization or a regional cooperation uh, framework on transboundary water rivers. Thank you very much, Father. Uh, I think for this rather positive outlook, actually, for EU engagement, um, I was happy to hear that the EU as an observer to ZARC, which I actually wasn't aware that the EU is an observer at the organization, can perhaps provide new international impetus to the organization and push Himalayan actors to be more engaged on water diplomacy across the region. And if at the same time, uh, the EU can, as you said, um, enable civil society dialogue, share best practices, share knowledge um, of its own experiences, um, of its own experiences, um, then I think this could be a good opportunity to close the expectations capabilities gap, which Zane has been talking about. Um, unfortunately, we slowly have to come to an end of the debate. Um, thank you very much uh, to both of you for a very, very interesting and rich discussion. I think you gave some good food for thought uh, to both um, Himalayan policymakers and European policymakers. So thank you very much uh, from our side for your engagement. Thank you also to all of our listeners that you joined us today. We will be back very soon with a new fresh discussion, bridging the gap between the EU and the global south. Um, in the meantime, we invite you to follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. You can find all the necessary links in the description. And we, of course, look forward to the next discussion. Uh, Fabio, Susanne, thank you very much again. And until then, stay safe. Mm -hmm.